Welcome to my talk, the not so simple mail transfer protocol. My name is Jos Elsgeest. I am a senior web developer at TD Media in the south of Holland. I've been there since 2008. I have been using PHP since one, uh, 1998 ish, uh, since version 3. Uh, and I've been using PHP professionally since 2000. I am married, I'm a father of two, I love ballroom dancing, as you might see, and I love all things uh, open source. I've been op doing open source stuff since 1995. Uh, I'm a small time contributor, uh, due to being a father, I don't have as much time as I would like. And uh, as of today, if everything goes well, since this is my first conference uh, talk ever, uh, I will be a speaker. I'm also a collector of elephants, uh, as some of you might also be. So without further ado, uh, what is my talk about? Uh, it will not help you send spam. Uh, it will not help you circumvent uh, any spam filters. And I will try to make you become responsible senders. Uh, I will try to educate you in the use of uh, SPF, DKM, and DMARC. And uh, if we have time, uh, I will also try to uh, answer your questions, the troubleshooting uh, email at reception. So let's get started. Um, in 2014, uh, we had a couple of customers who were sending, uh, as a core business, uh, sending email as new, like newsletters and stuff. Um, and we noticed that their mail, in some cases, stopped being delivered. Uh, mail was starting to get recognized as spam, and we didn't quite understand why. Uh, we thought it might be something to do with our server reputation, because we were sending a lot of emails. And uh, maybe that was, would be the reason why uh, some uh, hosts like Hotmail or Gmail um, were starting to block our service. And uh, when we looked at the mail responses or the delivery uh, errors, we started to see errors about SPF. And we didn't really uh, understand what this uh, thing was. So we started investigating. And we came across a thing like DMARC or DKM. And that uh, apparently also had some uh, influence on, uh, on email. We didn't know what it was. so. Also, we started investigating this. And in those investigations, we also came across uh, DMARC. So those are the things I would like to talk uh, about today. Before I start uh, telling you about SPF and the other acronyms, uh, I have to give you some history uh, into the SMTP protocol. And the first thing you might uh, know that is, uh, is that uh, SMTP is an old protocol. It's, it's as old as the internet. Uh, TCP and IP were defined in 1981 and SPF was defined in 1982 so it's one of the oldest protocols and at that time the internet was still called the ARPANET the precursor to the internet developed by the uh, Department of Defense as you might uh, remember from the talk by uh, uh, in the keynote <laughs> so um, Samantha yes thank you um, Back then, the internet was really small, and pretty much everybody knew each, uh, knew each other. So the internet was built on mutual trust. And that meant that there was uh, no authentication needed in the, pro in the protocol. And as such, there is no authentication uh, built into the protocol itself. So can anyone guess what this might be? This is indeed a list of all email addresses uh, known at the time. And actually, all email addresses are listed twice in this book, once alphabetically by name and once alphabetically by email. So there were not a lot of uh, email addresses known back then. Right now, we have billions of email addresses, and uh, there's no way we could put that in a dictionary. And also, spam uh, senders would love to have such a dictionary so they can <coughs> spam anyone. So how does uh, email actually work? Uh, on the top level, you would think, well, I type a message and I send it through the internet and it gets delivered to the inbox. It's slightly more complicated. Um, when a user types an email address in their fam favorite mail client, that could be Thunderbird or Outlook or uh, Mott if you are a command line lover, or you can just type it on your command line. Uh, it gets sent to an MSA or a mail submission agent. 
that stores it in its local queue. It transmits that to its local MTA or mail transfer agent. That system looks up the uh, MX records in DNS for the recipient's uh, email domain. It uses that information to send that message to the recipient's mail server. That gets stored in its local queue and that MTA will then deliver it to its local MDA or its uh, delivery agent and that will finally attempt to deliver it to the user's mail uh, mailbox. Or slightly more abstract, a mail user agent trans transfers the mail to an MSA, in turn to an MTA in the queue, it transfers it to the MTA, to the recipient's MTA and that finally gets delivered to its uh, local mailbox. If there is an error along the way, any MTA in the middle should either accept responsibility for that message uh, or reject the message with an error. And this is actually the power of the SMTP protocol. Uh, every hop in the system will either assume res responsibility and attempt to uh, convey the message onto the next hop in the line, or it will uh, respond with an error and deliver that error through the previous MTA back to the original user. That way, uh, SMTP uh, either uh, guarantees that the message will be delivered or you will receive an error that it has not been delivered. This makes it a very robust uh, protocol. It will keep trying to deliver the message until a, time to, uh, until a timeout uh, exists uh, or uh, occurs and uh, if it can't uh, deliver the message, it will respond. That was because back in the day, uh, the internet was not as uh, robust as it, today, as it is today, and not all mail servers were online 24 seven. So uh, apart from the SMTP protocol, there is a, uh, it has a twin, and that's the internet message. The SMTP protocol defines the envelope of the message, or the means by which to transmit a message, and the RFC uh, 5322, uh, or originally 822, uh, defines the structure of the message inside the envelope. It defines headers like uh, subject, from, sender, reply to, etc. And it defines the structure of the message body. I'm not going to in going into uh, what that message actually should look like. Uh, that's beyond the scope of this of, of this talk. So let's take a look at uh, actually sending a message. Uh, we can do this on the command line, very easy, using Telnet. We connect to a mail server on port 25. We get greeted by uh, mail, in this case, mail.example.org, which is, in this case, the recipient's mail server. So we're connecting directly to the recipient's mail server. We uh, greet the server with a hello command, or in later protocols, hello, E-H-L-O. Uh, and we use our uh, mail server name. And uh, in real life, you should make sure that your uh, mail server through which you are sending mail is reverse, reverse resolvable. So that uh, if, you have the, you have, uh, if you reverse resolve the IP address of your mail server, you get the same name as you are typing in your hello command. Next, we type uh, or we send a mail from command and we use our own email address. Next, we type the or send the recipient to uh, command and use the mail address of our uh, intended recipient. Next is the data command, and this indicates that we want to send our message. The, ser the server responds with, OK, send your message and end it with a single dot followed by a control line feed. We type our message. In this case, I send one header extra subject. Uh, we type a message, end with a dot and a control line feed, and the server says, uh, okay, I've queued it. We quit, and the message or the connection gets closed. If you were to look at the logs on the server, and in this case, I'm using Postfix, we can see our commands again. So the hello command, the from command, and the recipient to command. And we can see the uh, ID of the mess, the queue ID of the server under which the message has been queued in the system. And in this case, if you look one line below, you can actually see that the message has already been delivered to uh, the mailbox since it's the recipient's uh, mail server. If we look at the message itself after it has been received, we can again see the envelope, the top part. We can see a uh, received ex an extra received header, which is, has been added by the mail server itself. 
uh, and this is actually a trace of how the message uh, re uh, reached its intended destination. If you look at any source of a message, you can see a tail of received uh, headers indicating how this message uh, got to your mail server or to your mailbox. So as you can see, that uh, it's really easy to send a message if you have a mail server uh, impersonating anyone because the mail address I could have used could have been the one of Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or whomever. And that's because there, of course, is no uh, authentication built into the protocol. So mail servers developed some mitigations against this. And one of them is you have to require a fully qualified hello uh, or hello uh, name. So it has to be reverse, reverse resolvable. Um, mail servers added authentication before messages are actually sent. So you need to uh, authenticate yourself with uh, the mail server. Uh, DNS block lists have been, have been developed, but this is not a real mitigation because if you create your own mail server on a new IP address, that won't be in a block list and uh, anyone could still create one. And we, of course, we have spam filters which uh, heuristically check your message to see if it's spam or not. So the, problem, the real problem is that there is no uh, auth authorization in, built into the protocol. So theoretically, anyone with an MTA can send any message from anyone to anyone. And these mitigations are not enough to block this kind of abuse. There is no way uh, to know if that sender is actually allowed to send this message from this email address. And DNS block lists, of course, aren't uh, sufficient. So what do we need? We need some form of authorization. And this is where SPF comes in. The sender policy framework, as it's called, was uh, first mentioned in uh, 2000 on, uh, on the mailing list. And at that time, the, 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 uh, it didn't really get any traction. Uh, a couple of years later, in 2002, uh, two people, Dana Valerie Rees and Paul Vixie, who you might know as uh, one of the founders of the Internet Software Consortium, uh, proposed two uh, attempts. And these were uh, picked up and uh, were started to, started to being debated. And uh, as, a, as, as a result of that, the anti-spam research group was uh, founded as a uh, body for uh, investigating uh, spam prevention. Uh, two proposals were, uh, among the proposals uh, for SPF, there were uh, two. Uh, the reverse MX and the designated mail pro mailer protocol. And these were merged in 2003 and uh, started to get known as SPF. And the first official experimental RC was published in 2006. It was standardized in 2014, which explained why our problems started occurring uh, around 2014. And uh, this was the real, really first implementation of uh, SPF as we know it today. So how does SPF work? It allows the owner of a uh, domain to specify which hosts are allowed to send a message for that domain or send an email for that domain. It does so by setting a text record in DNS. And uh, there used to be a dedicated uh, SPF record. So if you still use it, if you have used SPF before, uh, it has been uh, deprecated in the last RFC, so you sh probably should not use it anymore. And it works on the envelope level of the message, so the hello command and the mail from command. If the receiving mail server authorizes of uh, reads the reads the SPF record from DNS and it author and it sees that the sending mail server is authorized to send that message, it will send uh, it will pass the message, and otherwise it will fail the message, and the message will be rejected with an uh, rep uh, error reply. So let's take a look at how a SPF record is uh, created. This is a DNS record. Uh, it is for the domain example.com, and uh, it's specified as a text record, uh, in this case, for SPF version 1. 
uh, it's always SPF version one, so the first part of any SPF record will be uh, B equals SPF one. In this case, any uh, system with an A record which resolves back to uh, the domain, in this case example.com, or any MX defined in uh, DNS for this domain, uh, is allowed to send any message. The tilde all means the default, and tilde means it's a soft fail. So it, I'm not sure if uh, email should be sent for this, uh, for this domain, but pass it anyway, but tag it as a soft fail and uh, do not send a reply. We can make it a bit more uh, specific, in this case an IP range. Uh, so any uh, system with an IP in this range or any MX can send messages. And the minus all means that any other system is disallowed to send messages from this domain. So any other system uh, trying to send email for this domain will be blocked. We can go uh, a bit further with this. We can also say that only a system with uh, a DNS record for mail.example.com, which is resolvable, uh, is allowed to send messages and all other systems will be blocked. So you, so you can see you can make any combination of uh, acceptance or denies uh, for uh, SPF records. There are a lot of mechanisms. I'm not going to uh, go into detail of, uh, of all of them. Uh, you can read that in the slides when I publish them. Um, the qualifiers can be set on any of those mechanisms uh, if you want. Uh, also, uh, you can read that in the doc in documentation or uh, in my slides later. There are a couple of limitations to uh, SPF. And uh, one of them is that if you define a wrong mechanism in your record, the entire record will be invalid and it will not work and it will always send a fail. Also, there should be less than 10 mechanisms requiring DNS. Uh, so any A record or MX record or include record will trigger a DNS lookup. And if there are more than 10 needed to find your system, it will automatically fail as well. And there's one uh, more caveat is that uh, SPF breaks forwarding. So if you have a message uh, from Hotmail which has an SPF record and you forward that from your mail server to a different email address, that uh, receiving email server will see your mail server as being the sending party for that Hotmail address and it will also uh, receive uh, a fail message. So creating our own uh, SPF record. Uh, first of all, you, you should use one of the examples we saw before. So defining which systems are allowed to send messages. But uh, apart from that, you should uh, only define, you should define an SPF record for any system either allowed to send messages or not to send messages. So in this case, mail.example.com is the only system allowed to send mail from mail.example.com. Otherwise, mail.example.com could also still be abused, abused to send uh, email. Same goes for your uh, World Wide Web address. Uh, probably none of you will use uh, www.example.com to send Actual, actual email, so you should deny uh, email from being sent from that subdomain. Same goes for your uh, application servers. And in my view, uh, you should always use a dedicated mail server instead of letting your uh, mail servers or your web servers or application servers themselves uh, send messages, so you can uh, granulate your control over your uh, uh, email domain. So. In that case, publish uh, null records, as they are called, for any other system which is defined in DNS but should not send uh, any email. Also, you can have includes. So, if, for instance, if you use a service like MailChimp, you should uh, you you should include the mail server or MailChimp's uh, uh, include records, and. Uh, that would allow the mail service of MailChimp to send messages for your domain. So some best practices for uh, implementing SPF. Always create a, li create a list of your known mail service, so of all systems uh, allowed to send mail. Create a list of all your, uh, of all your domains, because you likely don't only have example.com, but you might also have example.org or example.net and you should define SPF records for those domains as well. So uh, 
that system so that that domain doesn't get abused instead of your main domain. List the server only once, preferably using a uh, mechanism which doesn't require uh, DNS, so using IPv4 or IPv6. And only list MX servers if they are actually allowed to send mail. And most importantly, don't assume anything. If you are creating an SPF record for one of your clients, uh, make sure you understand their infrastructure and uh, do not uh, put SPF into production before uh, you actually have a good grasp of which systems are allowed or should be allowed to send email. Only include, uh, if you are using includes, only include existing SPF records because if you include one that doesn't exist, it will also automatically fail because it will get a DNS, record, uh, DNS error. And uh, if you can, use cheap mechanisms like IPv6 or IPv4. And uh, as the limitation said, uh, don't use more than 10 uh, DNS lookups, so keep your uh, SPF records as short as uh, possible. And last but not least, test, as you should always do. Uh, Kitman.com has an excellent validation uh, service. You can just paste your SPF record and uh, your mail server uh, IP address and your uh, email address, and it will check your SPF record against those two values to see if uh, you would get a pass or a fail. So some resources. OpenSPF.org is the main website for the uh, definition of SPF. Uh, MXToolbox.com has excellent tools for testing your mail servers and for testing your uh, SPF records as well. And uh, Kitman.com, of course. So, uh, a recap. SNTP has no authorization. Uh, SPF adds that level of authorization so we can check, uh, so we have a mechanism to check if email can be sent for that domain. And we have seen how to create an SPF record. But what about verifying that message itself? And that is where DKIM comes in. Um, DKIM adds a DNS-based cryptographic verification for emails, and it's designed to uh, prevent and detect uh, email spoofing. So uh, it does this by operating at the message level, and it does so by uh, protecting the headers of the message, so the subject from uh, reply to uh, any headers you have in your message from being tampered with in transit. And this allows an organization sending the message to actually take responsibility for that message because, uh, because it's digitally signed, uh, you can verify that the message has not been altered in transit. So no one in between has changed that message and no one in between uh, could have and no one else but you could have sent that message because you have signed it with your private key. So how does it work? We create a, D a new text record in DNS, a D DKM record, uh, and this record provides a public key through which the recipient's email, email server can verify the message. When signing this message, a hash is created of both the body and of all the headers in the internet message itself. And uh, a hash is added. This hash is added to one of the headers uh, in the message itself, uh, in, the, in the envelope. The receiving end decrypts this message and checks if the headers in the message are the same as the ones in the digitally signed version. It does so by comparing hashes, so it uh, encrypts the message at the, uh, at the receiving end and compares those two hashes uh, against each other. If they match, uh, this message will pass, and if they don't, it will fail. So if we look at this uh, slightly more graphically, we send an email, uh, we sign it with DKM, it's sent through the internet, the receiving mail server decrypts that message, it does so by looking up the public key in DNS, de uh, decrypting it, if it matches, it will sort it, to, it will be delivered to the inbox, if it does not, it can be sent to uh, spam, or a spam uh, folder. So creating a DKM record. First of all, we need to create a key pair. And we can do so by uh, using the command line, uh, using OpenSSL. We create a 2048-bit uh, uh, key. Uh, we store the private key, of course, in a safe location. 
and we publish the public key in a DNS in a D DKM record. Also, before we uh, create a record, we need to think about a selector for that message, uh, for that uh, for that key, because uh, you can have multiple uh, DKM records for for a single domain, and you select a key based on a selector. So uh, sales can have its own DKM key, uh, production can have its own DK, DKM key, support can uh, have their own key, uh, your website can have its own key, and in fact, any application could uh, use a different key. So we define a uh, selector for that uh, domain. When creating the record itself, we cut the public key, we strip the begin public key and end public key uh, from, uh, from the entire uh, text, and we store this in a text record. And uh, as you can see, we have a selector defined by a domain key on the example.com. So you always have a selector followed by underscore domain key followed by your domain. We have a version DKM version one. Uh, we have a key type of RSA and we have our public key. Uh, there are more options, but these three are the most important ones. So how do I use this thing? First, we need to configure all our mail servers to use DKM. Uh, if you use a mailer service like MailJet or MailChimp or uh, MailGun or whatever, they all have excellent tools in their platforms to uh, store your key and uh, define it. Uh, you should implement it on all your mail servers, so all your outgoing mail is uh, protected by it. And uh, if you use MailChimp or SendGrid, you should also uh, configure it there. The other option is that you configure your application to sign your messages before they get sent to the internet. And you can use Swift Mailer or you can use PHP Mailer or any other implementation uh, going around. A small code example, because this is a PHP conference, of course. And uh, I'm going to use Swift Mailer here. We create a transport, we create a mailer instance, uh, we define our settings for our private key. And of course, I did not store my private key in a safe location, as you can see, it's uh, in my application root. Uh, we define our uh, domain, our selector, and we create a new signer instance. We create a new message, as we should, as we do always, uh, in this, as we always do in the same way uh, with Swift Mailer. And in this case, we attach our signer to the message. And all the other things are the same as you would always do. You define your message and you send your message through the mailer. Uh, if you would like to make this easy using Symfony, for instance, you would create a factory and create a message through the factory which already has the signer attached to it. If we look at the message uh, on the receiving end, we see our normal headers, uh, but there's one extra header which is the DKM signature. And uh, the rest of the message as we uh, no would normally see. If we take a closer look at the signature, we see that we have used uh, DKM version one. We have used a algorithm of RSA 265. Uh, we have the body hash or a canonical uh, hash of the canonicalized body, which the receiving end can also check. We have our own domain. We have the headers which have been used to create the hash. We have an identifier, so anyone at example.com in this case. We have our selector, which the receiving end will use to look up the key in uh, DNS in combination with the D equals uh, uh, parameter. We have a timestamp when it was signed, and we have the actual signature of the message. This, re this header defines everything the receiving end needs to verify that this message has not been uh, tampered with in between. There are a lot more options, but you would only use these if you were to implement your own uh, DKM uh, signing uh, solution, which you probably won't and shouldn't. Um, so what are the advantages of DKM? We have a cryptographic verification of our message, which has been sent, and we increase the level of trust in your me that people can have in your message because, uh, because it is signed and it can only be signed by you because you have the public, uh, private key, it can only come from you. So 
if we add an extra layer on top of this, uh, mainly control analysis and reporting, uh, this is where DMARC comes in. And how does DMARC work? It uh, combines SPF and DKM in order to both verify both uh, signatures and both verifications. It, adds, it does this by adding an alignment check between the message and the SPF record and between the message and the DKM uh, header. And it also allows you to uh, specify a policy by which uh, messages should either be accepted or rejected if those two or if one of both or both do not match uh, the alignment check. Apart from that, it also adds a, uh, a definition in DNS by which receiving parties can send uh, responses uh, or error reports. And it also adds a method by which receiving servers can send aggregated reports on uh, delivery, alignment, and uh, uh, rejection of email which you are sending from your mail server. So as a domain uh, administrator, you can get more insight into which messages actually get uh, delivered or, uh, or are rejected, or if actually someone else is trying to abuse your uh, domain for sending messages, so spammers or something like that. Uh, so if you look at this, uh, the normal flow of a message, you send a message, it gets signed with DKM, it is sent to the receiving party, it is received by the, uh, rece the, 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 the end user's mail server, it does its normal checks of SPF, DKM, etc. And after that, DMARC kicks in. It will check if uh, SPF matches the header and it will check if uh, DKM message that mat uh, matches the header and it will apply an appropriate policy if it fails. So what does a DMARC record actually look like in DNS? Again, it's a text record. Uh, it starts with under underscore DMARC, which is the only record uh, DMARC will ever use. So in this case, underscore DMARC.example.com. Uh, version one of DMARC and the PCT uh, parameter or uh, argument is the amount of the percentage of messages received by the server which will be subject to the policy in this record. So when you start out using uh, DMARC, you can start with 1% of messages received, which will be applied, uh, which will get the policy applied. Uh, the policy can be uh, quarantine or for uh, subdomains SP. Uh, you can also set a, uh, 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 a policy and you can define two email addresses, one for aggregated reports and one for forensic detail, forensic uh, reports, and that is uh, failure messages. There are a lot more uh, options, which I will not go into, uh, apart from the last two, AD, uh, ADKM and ASPF, which is the alignment mode definition for uh, the policy appliance. Uh, and this can be relaxed or strict. If they are in a relaxed mode, uh, SPF or DKM must pass. If they are in strict mode, both must pass uh, for a message to uh, succeed in uh, the DMARC policy uh, appliance. So how does DMARC actually work? A message gets sent to the receiving uh, mail server and uh, what DMARC does is it takes the domain from the return path or the from part of the envelope and it compares it to the from part of the internet message itself. If those two match, the, if the domains of those two match, then SPF is, a, is aligned and it will get a pass from DMARC. The same for uh, DKM, only for DKM it will check the D equals part of the DKM header and if that matches the from address in the message itself, that one will be, applied, uh, will be aligned and DMARC will uh, get a pass on that. So depending on the mode of strict or uh, uh, relaxed, one of them has to be true or they both have to be true. If they both, ha both are true, then uh, the message will uh, get received. I told you er earlier that SPF breaks uh, forwarding. If you use DMARC and you put it into uh, relaxed mode, one of them can pass. So if your SPF record uh, 
fails, but your DMARC or your DKM record passes, you will still get a pass from DMARC and your message is more likely to be delivered instead of failing. So what's the, the advantages of, uh, of DMARC? It adds more confidence to the message. Uh, we can be more confident if DMARC passes that the message has actually been sent by the sending party, or us in this case, and we get more control over rejections. So we can say that uh, SPF records can fail, but D a DKM must pass and the message will still be delivered. And uh, most importantly, we get reports on delivery and failures. Uh, you can use uh, the DMARC's uh, report viewer on GitHub uh, to read uh, aggregate reports. You will get a lot of emails if you use this, uh, and you can use this uh, tool to actually view them. You'll get a message, uh, an email with an attachment, which is an XML uh, file, which you throw into this viewer, and you can view what uh, happened on uh, that system. There are uh, some other tools, uh, mainly DMARC Analyzer and DMARCian, which are companies which have set up portals. Uh, you can uh, there, there are paid services, and I'm not uh, aligned with them or anything, but uh, they have a great tool, uh, or both have great tools, in which you uh, define an email address at that service, and all, their, all your aggregate reports and failure reports will get sent to that platform, and you will get a dashboard indicating which servers uh, are sending mail for your domain, uh, how many message are, messages are passing DKM, are passing SPF, if anyone else is... Uh, abusing your domain, uh, etc. So some takeaways. Uh, of course, logging, as always. Uh, in my view, use SPF whenever possible, uh, so your domain does not get abused, but also that recipients are more likely to, or receiving servers are more likely to uh, authorize your server as being a sending party. Use DKM whenever possible. Uh, it's a little bit harder to set up because every mail, if to be effective, every mail server in your system should be uh, allowed or, or, or defined uh, as being, uh, or should be configured to send messages which are digitally signed. Uh, and if you use both, then you should also use DMARC in order to get more insight into your uh, mail delivery processes. And if you use DMARC, of course, analyze uh, all those uh, reports, preferably using a dashboard. Use a dedicated mail server, so you can uh, define your SPF records and DKM more closely. So if, if, you, if your application servers are all sending email, they all have to be configured in SPF. They all have to be configured for sending email through DKM or with DKM. And uh, always use, uh, a, a, when sending mail, always use a mail address which is linked to the domain from which you are actually sending mail. So do not send mail from example.net from a server which is an example.com. Uh, this will help with alignment of DKM and SPF in DMARC. So, if you use, you, so avoid using the uh, sender header. Uh, so you would have the sent on behalf of uh, header in your mail. Uh, you can use it, but I wouldn't. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, do you have any questions? Yes. So the question is, uh, why are the strict uh, the the the, the uh, configuration parameters for the DKM alignment and the SPF alignment uh, separated. So you can have, uh, you, it gives you a bit more granularity. You can say that DKM always has to pass, or you can say that SPF always has to pass, and you can say that relaxed, it can pass, but it may fail. So you, uh, if they are both relaxed, then uh, they can both fail. So when, when starting out with DK or starting out with DMARC, you can set them both to relaxed, and they could still pass if they both fail. You can set one to strict, so SPF must always comply, and you can set DMARC to strict, so DMARC must always comply. So it's an and or. Uh, uh, right. 
Yes. Yes. Okay, so the percent the the question is that uh, the percentage can be set on the DMARC, uh, the number of messages uh, subject to the DMARC policy. So if you start out with 1%, only 1% of all messages received through that policy, uh, uh, through that or on the receiving end, 1% of the messages received uh, will be subject to the policy. So if you increase the percentage of messages, so if you get more confident with your uh, email setup, uh, email setup of DMARC and SPF. Eventually, you will get to one hundred percent, one hundred percent of the messages subject to the policy, and the policy can be uh, quarantine or uh, reject. And when starting out with DMARC, you can also set it to none, as uh, so you can put it in sort of test only mode or view only mode so that uh, you can analyze your reporting and if, when you get more confident you can set it to quarantine or if you get even more confident you can set it to reject so you can say that if someone else is uh, abusing my domain and sending email uh, on behalf of my uh, domain and it is not aligned with SPF or DKM it can just be thrown away and I don't care if a uh, rejection message gets sent any other questions thank you for coming